flesh made by hands. That at that time, before we got saved, at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. There's a shape we was in before we got saved. Verse 12. We had no hope. No hope. No hope without God. But, verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by joining our church. Uh oh. I was reading the reverse vision. I may read the King James. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes far off are made nigh by being baptized. Nope. Sorry. By going in the, and turning over a new leaf and straightening up and paying your bills. No. You're made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, God's remedy for a sin-sick world. God's remedy for a sin-sick world. You know, this world this morning is sin sick. It's in a mess, sure enough. But I'm thankful and glad this morning that God has a remedy. You, know, you can never lay the blame at the feet of God. People through the years, they've always tried to say, well, if God knew the devil was going to cause Adam and Eve to sin, and if God knew all the people was going to suffer, and all this, why did God let it happen? It's His fault. Well, you've got to remember this. God always made a way out. God always made a plan. God always absolved Himself of any guilt so that man can't point our finger at God and say, it's your fault that all this stuff is going on. They might be a lot of educated, smarty, pants, trite, but they'll never be able to pin the blame on God for the mess this world in. It's the devil's fault, and God made a way out if you'll take it. If you'll take it. So God has it fixed so that on judgment day, you can't point your finger at Him and say, well, uh, you, it's your fault, nobody told me, I wasn't, you're having your chance right now, and I'm telling you, God has made a way. Let's think this morning, first of all, about the world being sin sick. This world is sick. It's sick spiritually. I, we've never been more steeples and buildings and Bibles, I don't reckon. But there's, this world is sick spiritually. They, somebody made a survey of the NCC. That's the National Council of Churches. And they talked to the, asked the question of ministers in the National Council of Churches. And 50% of them did not believe in the deity of Christ. They believe that Jesus Christ is a normal uh, person just like anybody else. Maybe a great teacher or something like that. 25% of them did not believe the miracles of the Bible ever happened. 62% of them did not believe in life after death. That means 6 out of 10 guys standing in pulpits across this world, around this world, don't even believe there is a life after death. And I, as one old preacher said, them guys ought to quit preaching and sell fuller brushes. Or get them uh, selling, uh, uh, what's that, liniment or something like that. Give them a decent job, man. Get an Amway or something. Uh, where they won't be so crooked. Taking people's money and the people believe in life after death. Amen? Somebody said uh, there uh, not long ago, Reverend Patricia somebody uh, from Harvard Divinity School, don't you know she's really going to lay some truth on you? She says this. She said, quote, we ought to celebrate Eve. Now listen to this nut. She says we ought to celebrate Eve. Eve and her uh, taking the fruit off the tree because she began the process of freedom. That, that, that lady, whatever she claims to be, said that Eve, we ought to be happy that Eve took the fruit off the tree because it began the process of freedom. I'm telling you, listen, people like that, that she ought not to be able to get driver's license if she believes that Eve, Eve began the process of slavery, brother, and we, we fell into sin and became servants of sin. Which brings us to a conclusion of beware of anybody coming around wanting to liberate you. Beware of anybody who shows up and says, we've come to liberate you from all this bondage that you're in. They're the devil, I guarantee you that. She told them the wrong thing. They, they, they were... 
called on to pray for dying people and don't even believe the verses that are in the Bible that comfort dying people. Somebody said this clergyman was called to pray for this fellow dying and he got the, he said, you got your Bible here? And the man said, there it is. And he looked and there was a verse gone here and a verse gone there. And that preacher said, why are these verses cut out of your Bible? And he said, because I've been listening to you teach all these years and you said they weren't inspired, wasn't supposed to be in there. So I took my scissors and cut them out. I didn't want no verse in my Bible that wasn't supposed to be there. And that's what they ought to do if they don't believe they're supposed to be there. But I'll tell you what, this world is sick spiritually. It's pitiful. It is sick spiritually. And not only that, it is sick socially. This world is sick socially. Our homes, nothing more than heartbreaking would be the words to describe the mess that our families and homes are in. It's pitiful what's going on. You hear it all the time. I've got a letter right here. I'll not mention any names. I'm not going to read it word for word. That a boy wrote me just the other day that was here at our camp just a few weeks ago. And he said, Brother Danny, hey, how are you doing? I want to thank God for you and the excellent week of camp. And he goes on to tell when he was here. And and he begins to tell his story here. He said, I'd like to tell you my testimony. And he tells me what church he goes to. And he begins to describe himself. He said, I've been in church all of my life. I've always had a way to church. At the age of five, my oldest brother started molesting me. And it went on till I was 18 years old. This is an older brother in a family that goes to church every single Sunday molesting a five-year-old boy up until he's 18. 13 years. Now, I want to tell you, brother, from the outside, people would say, that's a fine family. Those people go to church every Sunday. But I will tell you this morning, our world is sick socially. It's sick socially. It's unbelievable. The kids that go to bed at night, listen to mom and daddy fighting and screaming and throwing things. And this world is sick this morning. There's no telling how many young people right here in this church today in the past week have wondered, is mama going to be there when I come home? Is daddy going to be there when I come home? What's going to happen to my life? Am I going to be sent away to live with relatives? What's going to take place in my life? This world world is sick. I'll tell you. I, I know some friends of mine in South Carolina who recently adopted two little girls. They're both five years old and they're, they're not twins. They're 11 months and so many days apart. And they're sisters, five years old. And these little girls had to be taken out of the home. They took the mama up with these kids to court and they took them in there and they took this girl to court and they said we're going to take your kids from you if you don't quit uh, uh, abusing them. It happens that she's living with some guy and the guy that when they dropped him off the babysitter the uh, the babysitter noticed that they were dirty and that looked like they'd been beat and they found out that the man who was living with the mother was the one doing the abusing they took him to court and the judge heard the case and he made the ruling he said, I want to rule today. He said, lady, we'll let you keep your kids. Well, judge, uh, the court has ruled in favor of the mother. You keep them, raise them right, but that man can't be around. He can't be in your house. He can't be around you. He can't spend the night there. You can't have him near those children at all. Is that understood? The mother of those kids told that judge, no thank you. She said, if I can't have him, my boyfriend, in the home, then I don't want my two little blonde headed girl. Did you, did y'all hear what I just now said? I want to tell you something. There was a time in this country when a lowest down lost sinner wouldn't have done that to their own kid. You hear me this morning? Our world is sick socially. But I want to tell you what, brother, it, it, it's unreal. You, you get a chicken, you get a chicken with a bunch of little dibbies and try to take that mother hen's dibbies away from her and watch what happens. She'll claw your eyes balls out. You, you take a rat. They say that a mother rat, if it's got a, little, a bunch of little rats, will come up, uh, 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 will, come, will stand up on her feet and claw at you and fight till you kill her before she'll let you have her baby. What has happened to human beings on this earth? we become so self-centered and so in love with ourselves that we don't even care what happened to old flesh and blood anymore. I say this world sick socially.
but that will break our heart. I'm telling you what, but that will break our heart. And that's a mother. I've heard of cases where a daddy just deserted kids, but it's unreal to me that a mother, a mother for a boyfriend would choose a boyfriend. Listen, God help you ladies here this morning. You need to get back to loving your kids and realize that God gave you your kids and it's over your responsibility. And I'll never turn you back on one of your kids. I feel sorry for anybody trying to take one of my girls away from me. You say, oh, you can't raise girls. You hide and watch me. I can do anything but I have to. Amen? Amen? I'm feeding my bottle of rope, change the diaper, whatever I do, before I let somebody have one of my kids. And I want to tell you what this world is sick socially. What, what is wrong with us that we make our decisions based on just what we want? Not what's best for our boys and for our girls and for God's sake. Listen, now you can't just let this flesh run off and do everything it wants to. You've got to say no for God's sake and for the Lord's sake and for the Bible's sake and for the church's sake. And you want right. It's sick socially. This world is sick socially. I'm telling you what, it's unreal what's going on. Then this world is sick morally. It's sick morally. I don't even want to get into it this morning. It's, it is so... Did you know there is a move going on in America now to, to literally do away with the institution of the home completely? There's talk now of, of, uh, of you know, these couples living together. Two men, two women, one man. They had one man on show, on some talk show I saw at my house in Florida somewhere, where I was. But I saw this guy just for a minute, like two minutes of it. And this guy said, I think he was married to this one woman, and she was married to another man, and then he had his wife, but he was only married to his wife, but he was married to both these other ones or something like that. I think one of them was married to the man and the woman. He was his husband, and she was his wife, and she was his wife, and he was his husband. I, would tell you about, I mean, we laugh and joke. I mean, that's, to us, that's a joke. But I'm telling you, man, this thing is sick. This is sick morally. This is sick. Can you imagine walking down the street? I mean, the whole row of you. This is my husband, and that's his wife, and that's my other husband, and this is my other wife. And they all live together. I, 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 that's just like animals. I want to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, this world is sick morally. Have, have you seen this big, great, big, black, white, boy, girl, pervert named RuPaul? Uh, have you seen that pervert? I'm telling you, man, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's not black. It's not white. It's not male. It's not female. It's a big giant. It's like one of the giants in the Old Testament but it's energized with demons. A big, blonde-headed, black boy girl. So what in the world is a big, tall, blonde-headed, black boy girl? What? <laughs> this world's sick morally. And you know what? Years ago they put people like that in the nut house. Now they got their own TV show. And they're worshipped and idolized by thousands. You know what I know? You say, well, there's always been perverts. Yeah, but we ain't never made stars out of them till this generation. And it seemed like the more perverted you are now, the more popular and rich you get. Hey man, 1,500 years ago, Dennis Rodman couldn't have got a girlfriend. I will tell you what, brother, things have changed. This world is sick morally. It's sick. Jackie Gleason, all them old wicked people like him back in those days, they used to uh, charter trains and fill them up with girls and booze and live all kinds of ungodly ways. We are seeing today all over uh, murder, one per hour, 10,000 a year in the United States, not counting the rest of the world, the millions and a half abortions every, every, every year in this nation where girls are just saying, hey, I don't want my own kid. Cut its arms and legs off. Tie it body, throw it in the trash can. It don't matter if it's still kicking. I'll go right on out and party tonight and forget that it ever took place. I'm here to tell you this morning, folks, our world is sick morally. I'll tell you, so, well, Brother Danny, that's an awful bad picture this morning. It sure is. But thank God, God made a remedy. Thank God He made a remedy. God's always had a remedy. You know, when the serpents bit the people in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, God told Moses, "Build you, you put your little snake, put it up on a pole, that's the remedy. People look at it, they live. God made a remedy. When people were down in Egypt's bondage and they were down there dying and being hard 
work, God made a remedy. When Daniel was in the lion's den, God made a way out. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, God made the way out. I want to say to you this morning, here in 1997, God has a remedy. Thank the Lord. God made a remedy. He said you must be born again. He said you've got a heart problem. You're born wrong. You've got to be born right. You've got to get washed in the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is the answer for this old world problem. You know the world's never been worse off. So that means it's never been darker. So that means the light can shine brighter. We can shine brighter now than we've ever shown. Do you know that? What an opportunity. What an opportunity for our kids, for our school, to be a lighthouse for Jesus in these last days. What a change, man, we've got with these preachers and missionaries and all of us just to get to say, Hey, I know it's dark, but I know the answer and I know the remedy and it's here today and it's what can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The answer for the world's problems is not... Integration, segregation, it's disintegration. Blow it up. That's what the Lord's going to do. That's what He's going to do. Just blow it up and make a new one where everything's right. They said in San Francisco many, many years ago, there's a liberal preacher got up and there's a bunch of Christians there and it's great big, like a big camp meeting or convention. And this preacher got up and he started denying the blood. He thought, I'll go along with the modern trend. And he said... He had been taught, you know, that the blood of Jesus is no different than the blood of a, a dog or a cat. And brother, I'll tell you what, they taught that man the blood of Jesus Christ is just, is just nothing. It's just normal, just, just like anybody else. And I want to tell you something, brother. That, that old boy began to break and they said this. Everybody just sat there and they wasn't agreeing with him, but they're sitting there anyway. One dear old saint of God stood up. And they said that lady stood up back there in about halfway back in that congregation and she stood up and she began to sing. And she said, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. But he said as she began to sing that, that old liberal preacher looked, uh, looked stunned and, and boy, when she got through with that verse, uh, she began to sing the next, The dying thief. And a few more people began to join in around her and the next thing you know, uh, then uh, everybody in the congregation was standing singing, When in a nobler, sweeter sound I'll sing thy power to save when this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. And they all began to stand they shouted that old boy down and said, We still believe there's power in the blood of Jesus. I know this world calls it slaughterhouse religion. They make fun of it. They're laughing at me and you this morning for believing in a bloody religion. Oh brother, God gave the remedy. It was and is the blood of the Lamb. The blood can cleanse you up this morning. You don't need a psychiatrist. You need the blood of Jesus. Amen. He said, I can't figure out why I'm feeling like I am. That's them sins, man. They'll drive you crazy. Get them washed away. There's a fountain. There's a, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I want to tell you what happened to me yesterday. I had a good day. Lord bless me. I got a phone call Thursday. Might have been Wednesday. Thursday. And this lady called me. She said, is this Danny Castle? And I said, yep. She told me she was down here in Cleveland County somewhere around Shelby. And she said, she said, Brother Danny, I know you probably don't remember me, but she said, my brother um, is dying with cancer. She said, they told him you got probably less than three months to live. Send him home. There's nothing they can do. Send him home to die. And she said, he's not saved. He's not ready to meet God. And she said, he come and heard you preach in revival two years ago at Wallace Grove Baptist Church down in Shelby. And we took the youth choir down there, that little church. And she said, he mentioned your name, said he'd like to talk to you. And she said, out of all the people we know around here, she said, you're the only one that he's mentioned, said he'd talk to you. She said, is there any way that you can come and visit my brother? He's going to die. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'd be glad to. And I got directions where she lived and I told her I'd try to come yesterday. So yesterday morning I took off down there about 
uh, a little after nine, I guess, and I headed down toward Shelby and tried to follow the directions, and it was way, way on down, almost to Grover, North Carolina, almost to South Carolina, just a few miles from the line, and I was going down there, and I went down a little dirt road, lived in a trailer park, and there he sat, 59 years old, dying with cancer. And he said, you know how it was yesterday? He was sitting out on the front porch on the deck like this with his feet up and had blankets over him like this. Just swiveled up uh, the bones of a man. And I sat down there and I said, how you doing, Mr. Burton? And I began to talk to him. And he said, Danny, he said, I want you to know. He said, I'm not just doing this because I'm sick. He said, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. I said, oh, I said, don't worry about it. Don't matter what you're doing. As long as you get right with the Lord. If you're getting right with the Lord, that's all that matters. And I took the Bible. I began to show him the four steps that a person's got to know to be saved. I showed him in, in Romans 3.10. As it's written, there's none right, righteous, no, not one. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. I showed him that Jesus paid the price for our sin. I showed him how to accept it. I said, now, Mr. Burke, his, his sister was sitting over here on the porch. Her, her husband was sitting over there. And I know she she began to cry and tears started coming down her cheek. And I, something else, I started saying, Glory to God. I feel God out here on this porch. And boy, there's, there's flies coming around. I figured that's demons coming or something like that, you know. I'd knock them flies off. I said, Yay! You want to pray that prayer? He said, Yes, I'll pray that prayer. And buddy, I grabbed his hand. It was cold. And boy, that old fellow bowed his head. And he prayed that Jesus would come into his heart and save his soul. He found the remedy. He found the remedy. I said, hey, Mr. Burton, it don't matter what you've done. It's all taken care of in the blood of the Lamb. And boy, he got saved. And I'm telling you, they said, we hate you had to come all the way down here. I said, glory to God, I'd drive down here any day. See, somebody get saved. I come back up the road rejoicing. Amen. I was having myself a time. I said, hallelujah. I'm glad we can stand and tell this world. We got the answer. We've got the answer. You say, my boy's on drugs. We've got the answer for him right here. You say, my daughter's out there in crime, preacher. Here's the answer. You know what that old boy done? Before I left there, I was going to shake his hand. He's grabbing my hand, kissing it like that. Usually I don't let a man with a mustache kiss my hand. But I thought, I thought, Lord, he's dying. I <laughs> but there you know, and you know, he started kissing my hand. And it touched, I like to broke my heart, brother. It like to touch me. I said, glory to God, he made it in. He made it in. I'm so glad I didn't have to go down there and say, all right, now, you, you got to go to the church and go through the catechism and be confirmed. And all that. he ain't got time for all of that. He can't even get baptized. He's not able. I said, don't worry about it. You're in, man. You're in. You're in. You're in. Amen. You say, well, he's got to get baptized. Uh-uh. Water don't help what the blood of Jesus has already done. I believe anybody ought to get baptized, but you ain't a bit more saved, brother, after you're baptized than you are before you're baptized. Amen. Hallelujah, brother. We ain't no water dogs. We believe the Bible. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. God has a remedy for this old sin sick world. I read about many, many years ago in 1947, matter of fact, in the LaSalle Hotel in Chicago. 200 people got burned up. 60 people, or 60 people dead. 200 injured. And just before that thing, a businessman in there telephoned his wife. She begged him to come home. She begged him, said, Honey, please come home. I need you home. Please come. And he said, after one more game, he's playing cards and stuff like that. He said, after one more game, I'll be home. And that fire broke out in that big Chicago hotel and burned them people to death. And he was injured or dead in the list because he waited to one more game. God made a way for that boy to get out, but he didn't take it. God makes a way for you this morning to escape. There is an answer. There is a way out. But you've got to take it. One Sunday you're putting it off, might be too late. Next Sunday you may not have this opportunity. God's made a remedy for you. Jesus Christ died on the cross. I told that man yesterday, I said Christ died on the cross just for your sin. I said, Mr. Burton, think of the worst thing you've ever done in your life. 
I don't know what it was, but you think it. You might have, I don't know what it was. Murder. It don't matter. Whatever it was, you think of the worst thing you've ever done in your entire life. And when they put those nails in the hands of Jesus and through His feet, His blood was spilled and shed for that one sin and all the other ones too that you ever have committed or ever will commit. God made a remedy. God made a remedy. He can fix you up here this morning if you'll come to Him. Bible said, the world passeth away. The world passeth away. All the fads and fashions this world's got out there this morning, they're going to be gone. You look around, they'll be gone. You know, they've been talking about Elvis all week. All week. I reckon he died. This was the anniversary of when he died 20 years ago or something. Man, that's all you've heard. seen it everywhere you go. Elvis, Elvis. My, uh, my wife had radio on this morning on a... Listen to gospel music and they had Elvis on there singing. Sure did. I'd rather hear him as Amy Grant. But uh, uh, they had him on there and they began to... And I thought, you know, they won't let that poor fella... <laughs> they won't let him alone. And everybody made a big deal out of Elvis. You know what it is? They're trying to hold on to something that was in the 50s and 60s and 70s. The world passes away, buddy. You can't hold it. It's going... It's going. It's going. One day, gone. And we'll be standing out there in eternity. And all that's going to matter then is what you've done with Jesus Christ. It's not going to matter uh, how popular you were down here, how much money you accumulated, or how, what kind of property you owned, or who knows you, or how uh, well known you are in the big city of Marion. You reckon the rest of the world they don't even know Marion exists? We've got people running around here saying, Oh, I've got to keep my status in this city. Listen, man, we're not even on the map, hardly. You know what will do good for your self-esteem? Go to California. When the first time I took Carrie to California a few years ago, we was out there talking to these people. and You know, you th- we think the whole world's here, you know. And those kids were out there asking her. They said, Now, where is North Carolina? They don't even know where our state is. <laughs> They've never heard of Asheville. They've never heard of Shore. There's a big world out there, brother. And the United States is just a little part of this big wide world. What are you worried about it for? What are you worried about? Oh, yes, I've got my status to keep up. No, all you've got to do is worry about meeting your maker. Meeting your maker. Are you ready? God's got a remedy. You say, preacher, my life's in a mess. God's got the answer. He's got the medicine you need. He's got the antidote. He's got what you need this morning. You say, preacher, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm facing so many decisions. Right here's the answer. Right here's the answer. Commit it to the Lord and He'll make you make the right decisions. God has a remedy for a sin-sick world. Let's stand, bow our heads for prayer. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. I want to ask you a question. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask you a question. You say, Preacher, I'm faced with some things that I just don't know how I'm going to be able to get through. I just don't know how I'm going to make it. Some's already coming. Just Hey, he's the answer. He's the answer. You say, Well, I've tried it and I messed up. Try it again, brother. He's the answer. Try it again. Come on. Amen. Amen. They're coming. Folks are coming all over the building. He has the answer. Got marriage trouble? He's the answer. I didn't say it'd be all right overnight, but I'm saying this. He's the answer. He's the answer. God has a remedy. How about you mamas? Come and rededicate your life to those kids. Raising those kids for God. Amen. Heavenly Father, do what ought to be done. Use us for your glory. We know you have the answer. We know you are the answer. God, I know this is a sin-sick world. And I pray, oh God, in Jesus' name, that you would help us this morning. Be that you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.